this will be a little bit of a refresher for you, but we're also going to today touch on some of the proposed amendments uh, that were released by the ministry on October 6th. And we're also going to step through some frequently asked questions that have come up over the last several months as people are contemplating the implementation of this regulation. So I'll start just by giving you a quick introduction to our excess soil group here at Stantec. And then we'll do a walk through the basic requirements that will come into place with the regulation, as well as the different proposed amendments that the ministry released on October the 6th. We'll touch on a few other updates that are proposed through those amendments and just a quick overview of some of the different things that are happening amongst various provincial ministries. And then we'll do a deeper dive through frequently asked questions and some of the different strategies that can be looked at to manage the implementation of this regulation. Then we'll touch on some key takeaways and then we'll have time for some questions and discussion. So to start, you have speaking to you today myself, Krista Barfit, and also my colleague Tana Robinson. But we are just two representatives of a suite of senior resources here at Stantec that have specialized knowledge in excess soil management. And we are supported by a team of hundreds of environmental staff across Ontario. Uh, so we do have the depth and breadth to support a whole suite of different kinds of soil management services. I do want to note to any of you who are not aware that the Ministry has proposed amendments to the excess soil regulation. They were released to the Environmental Registry of Ontario on October the 6th and we have an open public comment period now until November 20th. Uh, Stantec will be putting together comments to submit on the proposed amendments uh, potentially corporately but also through the different ad advocacy groups that we're advocacy groups we're associated with, it, including the Canadian Brownfields Network Technical Advisory Committee, as well as the Ontario Environmental Industry Association Excess Soil Working Group. So, if you have reviewed the amendments and you have questions or comments, please do reach out. We can definitely get those incorporated into the comments that go into the ministry. And with that, I'll pass it over to Tiana to start walking you through the regulation. Great, thanks Krista. Um, so in this section, since many of you have already joined our Access Soil series, we'll provide a quick refresher of the key regulatory requirements and what you need to know about them for your projects alongside the relevant proposed amendments to the regulation. So first it's necessary to lay out a few key definitions in the regulation so that you can understand pertains to your site. Um, so the first definition we need to focus on is what is excess soil? So excess soil is soil or soil mixed with rock that has been excavated and removed from the project area. So it's basically soil that leaves the site. Now you'll see another key definition here is project area. Project area is not limited to a single property. It can be a single property or adjoining properties on which the project is carried out. And there are a lot of requirements and definitions around the project area you'll hear throughout this presentation, which is why we're emphasizing it here. The third definition we want to touch on is the project leader. That's the person or persons who are ultimately responsible for making decisions relating to the planning and implementation of the project. The project leader has ultimate responsibility to ensure that the various components of regulation are followed and they cannot contract out of this responsibility. So a lot of times previously um, you'd be able to sort of download some of this responsibility to the contractor or through the contract administration process, but legally now uh, this resides with the project leader. So you'll hear this term as well throughout the presentation. The regulation also establishes very clear quality standards for the reuse of excess soil. These are based on specific conditions at the reuse site, such as whether the groundwater at the site is used for drinking water, how close the reuse site is to a water body or sensitive receptors. There are generic standards that have been established by the ministry, but there's also the option to develop risk-based standards uh, for site-specific use, which take into account more site-specific conditions. Finally, different types of soil, such as if it's only salt impacted, may have special rules for reuse. To ensure the standards are being met and the soil is being used appropriately, the regulation has also established very prescriptive sampling and documentation requirements to confirm that the standards are met. These are laid out in what the ministry has termed the planning requirements. And this is where the key area where costs and schedule from the majority of your projects will be impacted. 
In addition, the majority of soil movements will be subject to these planning requirements. There are exemptions, which we will touch on later. Um, and the requirements include registering the soil movements on the public registry, tracking and documenting the soil movements, and providing basic characterization for the site and the soil. The basic characterization activities for assessment, sampling, and documentation include a background review called an assessment of past uses, which is very similar to a phase one ESA, and soil characterization activities that are very similar to a phase two ESA to determine the quality of soil that would be removed from the site and where and how it can be reused. These all need to be documented in appropriate reports, including an excess soil destination assessment report that describes what soil will be removed, its quality, and where it will be to. Completing these studies appropriately and efficiently requires incorporating them into the early planning and design stages of a project. Next slide, please. Another key change to how we operate currently are the prescribed sampling requirements uh, under the planning requirements. These will confirm the soil quality and it's based on the volumes of soil that will be removed. There's some relief from the sampling requirements as you get into larger and larger volumes of soil, but not a lot. Sampling and analytics is where a large amount of cost may start to creep in to your assessment activities. There are three approaches to mitigating these costs on projects. Which one you take will depend on the project specific requirements, such as size and scale. And we'll talk about risk management and contracting activities on that later. But the three approaches are as follows. One approach involves completing a large amount of soil sampling up front to help inform the design and determine what soil can be reused on site and what soil can be reused elsewhere. This helps with save costs on soil movements off site. The second approach involves determining through design which soil will be deemed excess soil and only characterizing that excess soil. This can help save sampling and analytical costs but may cause scheduling issues and leaves the project vulnerable to last minute design changes or changes during construction as it lacks maximum flexibility. The third is a hybrid approach. Limited studies and soil sampling can be completed up front to help inform the design and determine what should be moved off site. Additional sampling to meet the volume requirements can then be completed for just soil movements that you will be taking off site. This allows for greatest flexibility in the field and can still assist with cost savings and mitigation. Next slide, please. It is important to note that the sampling and reporting must be supervised or completed by a qualified person. A qualified person is basically an appropriate skilled professional engineer or professional geoscience in Ontario. One of the proposed changes that one of the proposed changes that was released on October 6 by the ministry is that the sampling results will have a stale date of 18 months. If your sampling results are greater than 18 months in age, a qualified person must certify that they remain current and accurate and that is nothing is expected to have changed. In addition to excess soil, the regulation provides requirements for soil storage and handling on site, whether it will be deemed excess soil or not. Um, the basic requirement is to prevent or ameliorate adverse effects. There are additional requirements for stockpile size, which you'll note here is a maximum of 2,500 cubic meters, as well as setbacks from water bodies, which is 30 meters, and property lines. The setback of 10 meters from property lines will be very problematic for many projects, in particular linear infrastructure projects. So the ministry has included a proposed change to this in the regulation. You can get a variance from the setback requirement from the property boundary if any of the following apply. You're storing a small volume of soil of less than 500 cubic meters, it's being stored less than a week. The storage location has a physical barrier between the stockpile and the property boundary, such as a concrete wall, or the storage is taking place in a public road or right of way. If you don't meet these requirements, you do not automatically fall under this variance. But the, the ministry has proposed an ECA process to allow for alternative soil storage processes on a site specific basis. Another proposed change to the regulatory amendments 
or regu regulation is for temporary soil storage sites. If you're considering using one, you need to return the site to the same or improved condition prior to its use for soil management activities. The Ministry District Office must also be notified of the closure. Finally, rounding out the proposed changes to soil storage activities is an exemption to the need to obtain an ECA for selected low risk and greenfield development sites, subject to certain basic rules with respect to management activities. The Ministry recognizes that it is common practice to compile topsoil from greenfield and other low risk development sites, such as greenfield residential, and to distribute it to development sites for landscaping or fill. With this proposed change, low risk operations such as garden centers and residential storage sites would also be able to continue to operate without the added burden of needing to obtain an ECA. So here's where I'll jump back in uh, and talk about transportation. So there are some new uh, requirements for transportation of excess soil that will come into play with the regulation. Now, for anyone who attended the webinar in May, there are no proposed changes to this that have come out with the October 6 amendments. This is one part of the, the regulation they really haven't touched. Um, generally speaking, the transportation of excess soil needs to be done in a vehicle that provides safe transfer without nuisance. And should that vehicle be pulled over by a provincial officer, the hauler does need to be able to provide that officer with some fairly basic information regarding the excess soil load that they are hauling. Now, in the short term, that information can just be provided verbally as a verbal record, but after January 1st, 2022, there will be a need for that hauler to have a more formal record that could be provided to the provincial officer. There's also uh, requirements in the regulation that are specific to liquid soil, and there are some proposed changes here uh, with the amendment that came out, so I'll touch on those in a moment. Generally speaking, though, uh, there is uh, some allowance for select dewatering or processing that can be done without an ECA for liquid soils, provided it's in the project area or at a local waste transfer facility. Liquid soil does need to be transported in a vehicle with quote unquote valves that lock. So you see in this picture here where there's an excavation of a swim pond and it's being dumped into the back of an open truck. This is not something that would be allowed under the regulation. I expect this is something the MTO would tell you is already not allowed, but the regulation makes very clear that it would have to be transported in a vehicle with valves that lock. The storage rules that Tiana just ran through will also apply for liquid soil, and the excess soil quality standards that have been developed will apply to liquid soil as well, although there's generally this understanding that the standards will be specific to dry soil, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, generally speaking, it's also understood that you will deposit um, excess soil as dry soil at the reuse site, but there are allowances to deposit it directly as liquid soil, provided you do get an appropriate instrument in place. And if the quality of the liquid soil is, is poor and it does not meet standards and it's not appropriate for beneficial reuse, then you do always have the option of landfilling that material or sending it for further treatment. Now, there's some very common types of liquid soil that people tend to deal with, and one of them is tunneling spoils. And this is a place where the messaging in terms of the management of tunneling spoils or the interpretation of tunneling spoils under the reg has changed. So if you attended the webinar in May, you would have heard that the messaging at that point from the ministry was if you are drilling uh, only or tunneling only through rock and it's 100% rock material, it's appropriate to consider those spoils as rock material and they would not necessarily require management under the regulation. That is no longer the case. So in the amendments that were released on October 6, the ministry has clarified that the understanding of whether or not it is soil or rock is going to be based fully on the size of the particles that you're generating. So the regulation does specify that it can be considered rock if your particle size is greater than two millimeters. Um, otherwise, if it's smaller than that, then it would be excess soil or it would be considered soil. And Part of the confusion on this has always been the definition of soil does specifically refer to the natural breakdown of material, um, but the ministry has clarified through this amendment that even if the material is mechanically rendered, for example, through a tunneling process, if you are smaller than two millimeters, then that material does need to be considered um, as soil and potentially look at management under that excess soil regulation. Now, whether or not you can actually beneficially reuse your tunneling spoils is going to be dictated by the quality of that material and that may mean you need some consideration of the kind of drilling muds you're using or potentially what kind of amendments or drying agents are being added to it. And as we talk about drilling muds and, and drying agents, we're drifting into conversation around contractor means and methods, which, of course, we never want to speak to and never want to provide direction on. 
And all I'll say is that if you have interest in potentially being able to beneficially reuse tunneling spoils, um, potentially to generate some cost savings on your project, then you do need to think about how you would account for that through the contracting process. The other very common type of liquid soil that um, people are often managing is stormwater management pond sediment. And the regulation does have specific language around the management of this material as well. And there is essentially sort of two scenarios under which you could be managing this material. One would be if you are managing and under the full requirement, the full planning requirements. And if that's the case, then there's very prescriptive sampling that's outlined in the regulation, which would first off include actually excavating and stockpiling that material, uh, having it having it dry, and then doing your sampling, again, with the understanding that the standards are specific to dry soil. The other scenario you could be working on is where you are exempt from the planning requirements. And, and Tian is going to talk in a, in a moment about the different exemptions for the planning requirements. But if you're operating under that scenario, you would have a little bit more flexibility in terms of how you confirm the quality of that material. And that could allow for the use of some in situ sampling. Now, on October 6th, uh, one of the proposed amendments was to allow an ECA process that would allow you to put forward and get approval for an alternative sampling process. So this could mean that even if you're operating under the planning requirements, you could potentially put forward an alternative sampling process for swim pond sediment that could include the use of in situ sampling um, and still be able to, to, to do that underneath the, um, in, in, in compliance with the regulation. And I think this, um, this proposed amendment for the alternative sampling process may be directly in response to concerns around the management of swim pond material. As I know, a lot of stakeholders uh, talk to the ministry about the challenge of having to excavate, stockpile and dry before you can sample in terms of space restrictions, logistical challenges and the whole double handling purpose. So I somewhat suspect that this amendment may be specifically targeted uh, in some sense to address the challenges with swim pond sediment. Otherwise, the excess soil quality standards will apply to this material as well, and you would select the appropriate standards based on the intended reuse site. And if you do not meet the excess soil quality standards, you do have the opportunity to seek a site-specific instrument that would allow you to apply alternate standards for that site. And my colleague, Francine Kelly Hooper, has had quite a bit of success in getting these ECAs in place that would allow alternate site-specific uh, standards for a specific reuse site. So what about timing? Most aspects of the regulation now come into force January 1st of 2021. This includes standards for reuse sites, quality for reuse, soil storage and processing requirements, and transportation requirements. The planning requirements, which we have discussed, which will add uh, cost and schedule implications, more cost and schedule implications to your projects, come into force uh, January 1st, 2022. At the bottom right hand side of the slide, you'll see two circles which capture uh, two additional items. To allow for phasing in of the regulation, the restriction on landfilling of soils of certain quality doesn't come into force until January 1st, 2025. After January 1st, 2025, uh, soils that meet certain reuse standards cannot be landfilled. There's also a grandfathering clause, which we'll touch on, which allows for certain projects to proceed with relief from some or all of the planning requirements until January 1st, 2026. We'll discuss those in detail in the next few slides. We've talked a lot about the planning requirements and that there are some exemptions. Uh, there are some key overall exemptions to the planning requirements, although it's important to note here that they're just exemptions from some or all of the planning requirements and that the regulation is still applicable. This means that standards for reuse quality and those for all overall soil storage in the project area, which we've already discussed, still apply. So there's a couple of different buckets in which the exemptions fall into. So special condition exemptions relate to emergency work, such as spills or the reuse of topsoil. There's volume-based exemptions for very small volumes of soil movements, basically in greenfield areas, as well as small volumes of soil directly transported to waste disposal sites. Finally, there's exemptions for selected infrastructure projects, such as soil excavated to maintain infrastructure in a fit state of repair, or soil being moved from one infrastructure project to another. And we'll, this is a key element for a lot of our clients. We'll touch on that quickly in the next slide. Um, 
In order to meet the infrastructure to infrastructure exemption, the reuse site must be another infrastructure project and owned by the project leader or a public body. What this means is when planning the work, the reuse sites would need to be identified and specified when contracting the work to capitalize on this exemption. And this exemption is relief from all of the planning requirements and not just select planning requirements. The other one which we've discussed um, is the grandfathering clause. The al regulation allows for a bit of a transition period so that projects are already underway do not have to go back and redo a bunch of work. Currently, the exemption reads that a project is exempt from the planning requirements if the project leader has entered into a contract with another person with respect to the management of excess soil from the project before January 1st, 2021. The proposed amendments have extended this contracting period till 2022. And this allows for relief from the planning requirements until January 1st, 2026. There is also an additional proposed change to the regulation to allow projects that have been delayed due to the pandemic. The ministry is considering expanding the grandfathering clause in several ways. First, they propose to extend the date by which the contracts have been entered into by a year. And the second is that if you have already completed selected soil quality characterization before January 1st, 2022, you're exempt from having to complete selected studies, including the assessment of past uses the sampling analysis plan and soil characterization report. Keep in mind, however, that the registration of the soil movement and the excess soil destination assessment report under the planning requirements still needs to be completed. And again, this relief is until January 1st, 2026. So uh, many of you are probably thinking, what does this actually mean then? Once we get into the new year and we're past January 1st, 2021, when all of this starts kicking into effect, and basically what it means, if you are a soil generator and you will be producing excess soil after January 1st, 2021, there will be an inherent need for you to understand the quality of the soil that you are producing. And that will likely involve some level of due diligence testing. You'll need to identify appropriate locations um, to which that soil can be sent. And if you're looking at a beneficial reuse site, you will need to get consent, written consent from the owner operator of that reuse site for the disposal of your soil at that location. Any transportation of soil will have to be in accordance with the reg, and that means that haulers will have to have that information that would allow them to provide a verbal record to a provincial officer should they be pulled over. And then any storage of soil will have to be in accordance to the regulation as well, unless that ECA, that proposed ECA process goes through that would allow for potentially getting um, permission for an alternative type of storage. But otherwise, all of those rules will be applicable to any ongoing work after January 1st, 2021, it does not matter if your project has been in process for five years, these will apply to any excess soil generated after January 1st, 2021. And we spent a lot of time talking about soil generation and source sites because that's really where the regulation is focused. Um, but I think post January 1st, 2021, it's also really important to be aware of what the different receiving site options are. And the regulation does speak fairly specifically to five different types of receiving sites. And so I just, and we've been throwing this language around through the presentation, but I just want to make sure you're all very clear on what these different receiving site options are. So the first two are class one and class two soil management sites. A class one site would be a soil bank storage site or a soil processing site. It is considered a waste disposal site and it would require an ECA. A class two site is uh, a site that would be only temporarily storing or managing soils. There are some restrictions around the ownership and what types of soils can be obtained. And the general understanding is this would uh, allow uh, low risk processing only. And so an ECA would not be required necessarily for a class two soil management site. Uh, the other type is a local waste transfer facility, which has the exact same definition as it does in Regulation 347. Um, and similar to a Class 2 site, low risk processing only would be allowed at these sites, and so an ECA would not be required. And then, of course, there's your beneficial reuse sites. And what's really important to note about a beneficial reuse site is there does have to be an identified beneficial purpose for the excess soil it is receiving. So that could be backfill, grading, rehabilitation. Um, but it cannot be uh, just for the purpose of receiving excess soil. If that's all it's doing, then truly what it is is a soil bank storage site, and now it's a class one site, and that's something different. 
And then, of course, there's landfills and dumps, which are defined exactly the same way they are in the waste regulation. Just touch quickly on some other proposed updates that are coming out with the October 6th Amendment, um, some of which are, can be quite important. Uh, and one that I think is going to be quite positive for the industry is a proposed change to the language around the salt exemption. Um, and the, the ministry did build into the regulation um, some exemptions to allow better reuse of soils that might be salty, for example, you know, roads next to so uh, so soils next to roads. Um, but one of the lists they had in that um, exemption was a prohibition on putting any salty soils within two meters of a water table, um, which obviously creates a number of challenges. I mean, typically we're not putting monitoring wells in at a reuse site, so understanding the depth to water might be a challenge all by itself. Um, but I think the, uh, the ministry did recognize this would really um, restrict the potential to reuse salty soils in a lot of parts in Ontario. And so that restriction is being removed. The ministry is also changing some of the requirements around leach testing. Uh, in the original regulation, they were leaving open different types of um, leach testing procedures that could be used to uh, assess leachate from soil. And they've now come out and clarified a specific procedure that will be the preferred process. They have also clarified, which I think is also very positive for the industry, that you will not have to complete leach testing on soil that meets background concentrations. And they've also added in some flexibility for QPs in terms of selecting samples that require leach testing. Previously, the language really indicated that you would have to selectively choose the soil that had the maximum concentrations observed in your in bulk sampling and do your leach testing on that, which creates all sorts of logistical challenges because it essentially means you'd have to do all your bulk concentrations, identify your maxes, and then do your leach testing. So from a soil management perspective, it adds a lot of layers to understanding quality. And so they're, they're adding some flexibility in for that as well. And then they're also selectively updating a few leachate screening levels. The uh, um, Amendments released on October 6 also include some clarification around how the regulation does or does not apply to operations under the Aggregate Resources Act. Um, in the original version, there's language about how the excess soil regulation does not apply to um, operations that are under the ARA. And now they have clarified that that is only true for basically the material that's being excavated and extracted from that operation. Um, as part of their license under the ARA, but other soil movements would be under the excess soil regulation. So if you're importing soil for rehabilitation or for other beneficial uses to an aggregate operation, that would have to happen underneath the excess soil regulation. And then there's a whole suite of other activities happening amongst a suite of different provincial ministries to prepare for this incoming regulation. The MECP is developing a series of fact sheets to help uh, explain and educate um, the different stakeholders on the excess soil regulation, and their hope is to release those before January 1st, 2021, obviously. Um, the Ministry of Transportation is also looking at updating their OPSS forms and guidance documents to make sure it aligns with the regulation. M uh, MMAH is looking at bylaw processes. I know some municipalities have over the years to try and, and deal with excess soil. Um, put fill bylaws in place or just um, put in requirements around fill in their site alteration bylaws. So that's being examined as well. MNRF, again, is looking at how the excess soil regulation will interact with the ARA and, and making sure that there is good alignment between those regulations. And then finally, OMAFRA is doing a lot of outreach to property owners. Often agricultural sites have become fill sites in the past, so there's a lot of um, outreach and education to those property owners as well. So a lot of moving pieces um, amongst uh, various uh, provincial ministries. So uh, expect lots of updates and changes as we go forward. Next, we're going to cover some frequently asked questions as well as strategies um, for you to use and actually incorporate this into your processes and uh, project management going forward. Two of the frequently asked questions we get are regarding sampling and testing. So the first is, are both in-situ and ex-situ soil sampling required? And is there a time restriction between testing and reuse? The regulation does not require both in-situ and ex-situ sampling, but if you're doing one or the other, you need to follow the volume-based sampling requirements. As we touched on previously, a qualified person must certify that sampling results remain current and accurate if results are greater than 18 months in age. But you also need to be considering the reuse site requirements as your sampling and analysis plan might not meet the sampling analysis requirements of your reuse site. So a couple of things you can consider for your 
need to be considered in your sampling strategy, which is your planning needs. When do you need the soil quality information? Is it pre-design or is it more useful after design to inform you what the quality of soil is going to go off site? Where do you want to take this soil? What are the fill site requirements in terms of quality, as well as any sampling and analysis requirements they have? Can you accommodate potential changes to that soil uh, that will be going off site in your sampling plan? Um, there's also, we find a lot of time, there's a time lag between planning and construction. So you need to make sure that you're collecting representative data and things aren't changing at your site. Sometimes there's a site that's going for construction and we find after we've done some pre-sampling and testing and analysis that perhaps some additional soil has been moved to that site. So that would represent a change to site conditions that would need to be considered. Managing just uh, given all of the stockpiling and setback requirements, do you have space for stockpiling, staging? How are you actually going to do your construction going forward? Um, can you accommodate this in your sampling plan or do you have to accommodate this in your sampling plan for ex situ sampling? Uh, who is going to ultimately be responsible for making sure that the regulation is followed um, in your planning and design process as well as during construction? Keep in mind there is also the ECA process or the proposed ECA process for alternative sampling requirements, which could allow you some relief from having to collect so many samples. The question we get is what about variations in soil quality and do we have to do multiple sampling events? Should we be considering multiple sampling events? Um, oftentimes soil quality is assessed in the pre-design phase of a project, which can be uh, a couple years before the design and construction phase. Um, we have clients that then require that the additional soil characterization is completed by contractors during construction. Um, and they see that this produces concentrations above the applicable standards and it can't do the, go to the reuse sites that were proposed. Soil becomes man managed as an out of scope item and this results in additional costs and delays. So how can we actually manage this risk? So you have two basic options for this. You can complete all the sampling ahead of contracting, but this would require you knowing the receiving site and what its requirements are. There's a risk of work being delayed and data becoming outdated. And your qualified person, if there's several years between when you do the sampling and you actually get to construction, may change and the reliance on the data may become an issue. You can try to manage this risk through your contracting process in a hybrid approach. So your tenders can include information on the intended fill sites and what those requirements are. Also risk management plans uh, for when limited soil quality exceedances are observed. So how are you actually going to manage this um, within scope? Tenders should include risk management plans if contaminated soil is encountered, as well as allowances for that, as well as soil management plans as part of pre-design and those should go in the tender as well. So the contractor is as informed as possible um, within the RFP. If you are requiring that your contractor retain a QP as part of the tender, you want to have your contracting process, an evaluation in your contracting process to evaluate that QP um, to your satisfaction. You could also retain your own QP to oversee the soil management as part of the contract administration. But however you decide, you need to establish an appropriate workflow in the contract administration to make sure that you are receiving sampling results, sampling information, and receiving site information in a timely manner. The other question we get is what sort of documentation is required prior to January 1st, 2022? Recall that January 1st, 2022 is when the planning requirements come in. Um, so as we've talked about, you want to do some level of due diligence sampling. Um, but the other thing is that the regulation does, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> The regulation only requires receiving site consent in writing prior to accepting the soil. An OPS F183, a form that's commonly used in the construction industry, may not satisfy your project or legal requirement. Once the soil is at the source site, you need to keep, uh, sorry, it's at the receiving site. You need to keep in mind that the receiving site is 
is responsible for its ultimate placement or final placement, but the source site is responsible for the proper management. So making sure that you're sending the quality of soil to the reuse site that meets the reuse site's criteria. Therefore, as we discussed, completing due diligence testing, requiring the contractor retain a QP to oversee and track the movements of soil, having an approval process uh, for these receiving sites uh, from the project leader or project owner, and receiving and maintaining related documentation are all good practices that you should consider putting into your tender documents. Another FAQ that we get is what happens if non-compliant soil placement occurs and the ministry believes it's soil from your projects. We've seen this on a couple sites um, uh, over the years where receiving sites took in soil from various different source sites. Some of the soil was contaminated and then you had to go back and figure out um, who actually owned that contaminated soil. So obviously, if this happens, you definitely want to be checking in with your legal counsel. But this is why it's so important to have that documentation and to put in your contract um, that the contractor needs to be submitting this documentation to you and to your satisfaction. Um, the other thing we get is what if the contractor doesn't submit the receiving site accepting information? Can we issue a stop work order? Well, Again, what does your contract say? So you want to be managing this risk in your tendering in your contract. The next question is, <clears throat> what about where it's taken? So we've talked a lot about the source site is ultimately responsible for where this stuff goes. Historically, soil placement has been a bit of a black box for the project leaders. Um, it gets put in the contracting documents, the soil is removed, the project leaders don't necessarily know where it's deposited, they don't necessarily track it. The regulation, as we've discussed, now requires the written consent by the owner-operator to deposit the excess soil at the reuse site. And the fill and reuse site can have their own sampling and tracking requirements in addition to the planning requirements that we've discussed. So you have a couple of options here. Um, between, you know, now in the phasing in of this regulation, as a project leader, you probably want to be networking um, for the reuse and disposal sites and specify these requirements in your tenders. You can also have the bidders identify the proposed reuse sites and bids and evaluate as part of the tender. But there are some risks to this in that because we tend to have a large lag in between when we're um, doing some of the design and the construction or delays now because of COVID-19, between the tendering and construction, those planned re reuse sites could become unavailable. And you could also have a limited tender evaluation process to accept those. So one hybrid approach that could be considered to manage this risk is to propose the reuse disposal sites in the tender, but also allow flexibility for contractors to propose additional sites and have a built in evaluation process for the bids to assess the appropriateness of the proposed sites versus cost. The hybrid approach allows the greatest flexibility because consider if the proposed sites have different sampling requirements. What if the QP at the reuse site disagrees with the source site QP? Because of this, we expect to see firms either sampling everything or proposing minimum sampling to win the work, but the risk for minimum sampling is higher for selecting and aligning with reuse sites. You also want to consider if you're not bound to the planning requirements, what guidance should be put around the volume of sampling to do? Again, we expect it to be driven by the reuse site and therefore knowing your reuse site or potential reuse sites is key. The final thing to consider is what is your own ability to accommodate excess soil? So can you look at uh, your own sites, perhaps uh, your municipality with uh, various properties? Can you look at your own sites and your own site inventory and find beneficial reuse, reuse on your own property rather than having to broker this out? And one of your options for looking for reuse within your own properties, um, and, and if scenario works out for you, probably your best option is looking for reuse within that same project area. So as you may recall, uh, in the early stages of this presentation, Tiana noted that project area is defined as a single property 
or adjoining properties on which the project is carried out. So there is some flexibility in terms of how you might define the project area. But if you have a scenario where you have the opportunity to reuse within that project area, you're not really generating excess soil. And so the management of that material happens a little bit beyond the limitations of the regulation. So I'm just showing you on the screen here a hypothetical example where potentially you would have a, a swim pond that requires clean out within a construction area. And here you could look at the opportunity to potentially reuse that swim pond material within the area that's still under construction. Now I do want to note um, this is not a carte blanche, just willy-nilly move your material wherever you want within a construction area because regardless of whether or not you're operating specifically under the excess soil regulation, you're always operating under the Environmental Protection Act. So you always have a responsibility to making sure that your use of the soil would be guarding against con con, um, allowing for any kind of adverse effects. So you still need to have an understanding of the quality of the material and you still need to make sure that your placement is appropriately protective of adverse effects. But this would give you some potentially additional flexibility in terms of managing those soils. Can't reuse within the project area. Um, as Tina noted, you might want to look at some of your other properties that you own and do any of them potentially need soil and can they be identified as a reuse site? And there's different kinds of reuse site, but I'm just going to focus on the ones that would not be governed by an instrument as this is likely where you'd probably want to first look for opportunities to reuse the soils that you might be generating. And I just want to remind you again that um, in these cases to have a beneficial reuse site, the excess soil does need to be being used for a beneficial purpose, such as backfilling, grading, or rehabilitation. The primary use cannot just be to deposit excess soil. That would make it a soil bank site, which would be a class one site. Um, and when you look through the regulation in terms of what's required for reuse site, what's interesting is it doesn't have a lot of specifications for reuse sites. The regulation is very much focus, focused on the, the source sites. Um, you do start to see some more specific requirements once you get to uh, receiving sites that have larger volumes of soil, such as greater than 10,000 cubic meters. Um, if your reuse site is, is receiving a large volume of soil greater than that, then you would need to file a notice in the registry and, and provide some specific information about your reuse site. And you would also have to develop some procedures for tracking soil loads, um, how you're storing soil at the site, and also how you're placing it. Generally, though, as a reuse site, there will be a need to identify what the applicable standards are for um, and that could involve coming up with some site-specific standard if that's appropriate, um, and that could be through the use of the BRAT tool or potentially some other uh, risk-based method um, that may require the use of an instrument to get those in place. You should always be obtaining reports and information regarding the excess soil that will be brought to your site, and there is a requirement, especially for the large site, that you are expecting each load of soil as it comes in to make sure it is consistent with the reports and the information you've been provided on that soil. Now you'll notice absent from this list is sampling requirements, and that's because the sampling requirements in the regulation are very specific to the source site. However, do know that would mean if you don't do any sampling, you are very much relying on data generated by others and paid for by others that from a legal perspective, you may or may not really have any reliance on. So depending on the scenario, you may, as a reuse site owner, um, always want to consider doing some due diligence sampling on your own just to make sure that you are actually getting the quality of soil that, um, that you've been told you will be receiving. As we talk about all these questions about when is the, the best time to do sampling and when should the work be contracted or how should the work be contracted and managed and how do we identify uh, reuse options, what we're really talking about is how do we evolve the soil management strategy for the project. And essentially it happens through a series of stages with some key considerations built in that, um, that we've been touching on kind of through this webinar. So the first is what is the actual volume of soil that will require management? So this is identifying the footprint and the depth. And as Tiana noted, you have to consider in identifying that volume where you're at in the design process and what the potential is for that identified volume to change over the course of moving to detailed design. Because ultimately that will affect how you have to set up your sampling strategy for the project. Then you do need to determine the quality of the soil that you are anticipating requiring management as excess material. And keep in mind that the larger the volume of soil you're managing, the better the chance there will be some variation in quality through that volume of material. So if you have a, a long lunar infrastructure project that stretches for several kilometers through several different land use areas, chances are you're going to see variations in quality through that material. So you'll want to make sure you are considering that as you're working through identifying potential reuse options. And the first option you'll always want to look for will be beneficial reuse options. Or these are typically going to be the most cost effective options with the costly option being reuse in the project area if that's at all possible. 
but failing that reuse at other sites owned by the uh, same uh, project leader and then potentially reuse sites owned by others could be explored as well. Or if the quality is poor, then you will be looking for processing or disposal site options, which are generally going to be a more expensive option. Or if you need to create some space in your schedule, either because you need to uh, do some ex situ testing to determine the quality of the material, or perhaps you have a reuse site in mind, but it's not yet available to receive soils when you're excavating it, then you can explore different temporary store storage options. And then if the quality is good, it could get sent off to the reuse site. And if not, ultimately be disposed of um, at a disposal site. But inherent in this process should always be some consideration of whether or not your own projects can accommodate the material that you're generating, as this is always going to be your most cost effective option. And I would emphasize in that uh, local areas for sure will always be your most cost effective option. And as I um, emphasize about local areas, this becomes relevant um, when we start talking about the potential for soil to have naturally elevated concentrations as well. We tend to get a lot of questions about what do you do if your soil has naturally elevated concentrations? And I know there's parts of Ontario where this is quite relevant. I know Ottawa tends to have elevated barium. Uh, Thunder Bay tends to have elevated vanadium. And there is language in the regulation that does allow the reuse of these soils that have these naturally elevated concentrations, but it does have to be in that same area that also contains that same naturally elevated concentration. So again, uh, local reuse sites will be, will be really key. And we of course get a lot of questions about what is going to be the additional cost of aligning programs to the new regulation. I mean, obviously there's some additional analytical and reporting and tracking that's coming into place with this. And the number crunching that we've seen so far is generally indicating that you can expect about one to two dollars per cubic meter as an additional cost for excess soil that will as long as you're dealing with larger volumes at larger sites. Um, all things being economy of scale, if you're moving smaller soil volumes, then you can expect that cost per cubic meter to be higher. Generally speaking, though, what you can expect to see is an increase on the order of about 1% of the development cost. So yes, there is an increase in cost, definitely, in bringing um, your projects in alignment with this regulation, but it may not be as exorbitant as I think some people generally thought it might be. Chris, we also, oh, um, yes. we've lost the advancement of the slides. Oh, which one are you stuck on? Uh, we're stuck on local reuse. I will stop sharing and try to, let's see if that works. Thank you. So you may just want to touch on the um, analytical reporting tracking cost one more time. Okay, can you can you see it now? Am I sharing? Not yet. Okay, hang on. Let me try again. Uh, I can see it now. Okay, excellent. Now let me try getting into proper formats. Are we good? Yep, perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Yep. So here's the here's the slide on the additional costs. Um, so as you can see here, expect about one to two dollars per cubic meter as an additional cost for excess soils as we soils that you're removing from your property as long as you're managing larger soil volumes and then obviously if you're dealing with smaller soil volumes that cost per cubic meter um, can be expected to be higher and then overall you should expect an increase on the order of about one percent of the development cost so again there is definitely an increase in cost but it's not as high as I think most people thought it might be did that advance Tiana yep we're good now awesome um, so we also get a lot of questions about MECP enforcement and how the ministry will be overseeing the enforcement of the regulation. And the ministry has not said a lot about this, but they have said that it will be enforced through the use of their provincial officers and generally on an audit or complaints-based process. And we have got a question about um, what happens if, as the owner or project leader, you hire a QP and you set up your contracts as best as possible and in good faith you try and align to the regulation and something still goes wrong, will the ministry still be seeking damages from the owner or project leader or would they go after the party that, that actually failed to comply? 
Um, and of course, we're not at all in a position to speak on behalf of the ministry or to tell you what the ministry would do. Um, but what I can say is the ministry has been very clear that the responsibility for implementing the regulation is on the project leader. So that will always be the first place the ministry focuses if there has been a non-compliance issue. That said, the ministry has all of the power to name multiple parties and whatever orders they might generate. So they may choose to also name a contractor or a consultant or a hauler or whomever they feel is appropriate in the circumstances. So that's not to say the ministry wouldn't necessarily chase after other parties, but their focus will always start on the project leader. And having said that, it's probably good to understand who exactly is the project leader. We get this question a lot or, or who could it be on any given project? And it is defined in the regulation as being the planner and implementer of the project. But I think a good way to try and understand it is it's usually also going to be the funder of that project. Um, the only case where that's probably not true is a case where an agency is fully just handing over money and is not engaged at all in the planning and implementation of, the, of that work. Um, but generally speaking, whoever's funding it is usually engaged in the planning and implementation and leading the decision making on that project. And that will be the party that is the project leader. We've also had questions about what if the reuse site is not on provincial land? Um, so for example, perhaps the reuse site is gonna be a federally owned area and the regulation will still always apply to the source site and it will always apply to whatever transportation happens on provincial roads. Um, and then it would stop applying once the soil is on federal property because then it would fall under federal jurisdiction. We also get questions about projects that might be in construction right now and what happens if they continue into 2021 and beyond. Does this regulation still apply? And the resounding answer is yes, this regulation does apply. After January 1st, 2021, there are no exemptions to the regulation as a whole. Um, the exemptions that exist are specific to the planning requirements. Which brings us to the next question, which is what if uh, a project's in construction before 2022, do the planning requirements still need to be completed? So the proposed amendment that was released on October 6 basically means that if you have construction projects initiated, and I interpret that as contracted, but I have a question mark there because that's something we do need some clarity from the ministry on. But if your projects are initiated before January 1st, 2022, you are exempt from those planning requirements up to January 1st, 2026. So if your project will extend beyond January 1st, 2026, then the planning requirements will become required at that point and so you would need to get your project into compliance by that date. Another question we've received is how does the grandfathering clause apply to current projects? Is it just to the planning requirements but still still must be characterized prior to reuse? And yes, that exemption is only to the planning requirements. The soil quality standards will still always apply. So there's always going to be some need to do some due diligence sampling and understand the quality of your soil and make sure that it matches the standards that are applicable to the reuse site. Where you have relief is the sampling is not prescribed. You don't have to follow the exact sampling requirements per the regulation. And what about the disposal of drilling mud? Um, really the disposal of drilling mud will be dictated by its quality. So if the quality meets standards, then potentially it could be treated as excess soil. Um, and if not, then it would be treated as waste. And I'll just finish because we have so many questions on the grandfathering clause um, by noting that if the grandfathering clause does not apply, then any work after January 1st, 2022 will need to meet that full, the full planning requirements. So you should be planning for that in any work that you're anticipating will be starting or initiating after January 1st, 2022. Right, so uh, we know we've covered a lot of information here. So we're just going to um, review some key takeaways. Um, you know, we get a lot of questions. What do I need to do now between now or sorry, between January 1st, 2021, and then when the planning requirements come into effect. So what do you need to do to start planning for your projects? As Krista has emphasized, you need to know your soil quality, whether this is the minimum amount of due diligence sampling or uh, more is required to meet reuse site requirements. We're seeing a lot of reuse sites requiring um, that volume of samples uh, be collected and a minimum number of parameter lists. Um, so once you know your soil quality, you can confirm um, confirm whether it meets any reuse requirements. If it doesn't meet the reuse requirements, it generally needs to be managed as a waste. Um, if you're not wanting to manage it as a waste, find your reuse sites <clears throat> and you need to obtain written consent from the reuse site. While the soil is on your site, 
uh, you need to be managing it in accordance with the regulatory requirements. So that's the setback requirements from property boundaries, as well as water bodies, uh, the stockpile sizes, et cetera. Once it's leaving your site, you have to have a safe transfer without nuisance. So we've covered that in terms of uh, truck requirements, especially for liquid soils. The hauler has to have the required information, which is the verbal haul records, which Krista has already covered on, really just understanding what the quantity, quality of soil that was leaving the site, um, where it's going to, and who is ultimately responsible for answering any questions about that. So next we'll summarize what you need to think about again in terms of project delivery strategy. Um, so your sampling strategy, uh, when is it most beneficial to collect this quality data? Is it to inform your design as we've discussed? Is it after you do your design so you understand where your excess soil is actually coming from? Um, or do you wanna do it in uh, more of a pre-design phase so that you can inform your actual cut fill? On um, the logistics of the sampling strategy. So how are you actually going to sample? What's your approach? Do you have some due diligence required due diligence versus the prescriptive sampling approach, or are there reuse site requirements? Can you accommodate in your sampling strategy and plan the potential for change in the areas to be excavated, your total volumes or your designated volume, and who's ultimately going to be responsible to oversee the sampling strategy? There's risks and benefits to each approach which we've covered and how easily this risk can be managed then during construction. When you get to the construction phase, what is your actual soil management strategy? Are you going to reuse this in the project area or can it be reused? Are you gonna reuse it in other owned projects or locations uh, by the project leader or by the funder? Uh, have you considered other reuse sites or soil brokering? Uh, what is the timing of which they're available to, to um, accept any fill? And if you don't meet the reuse criteria, do you have potential disposal or processing sites? And what are your costs going to be, your incremental costs for having to manage it as a waste instead? So again, balancing cut fill, uh, keeping as much soil on your project sites as possible uh, is going to be key sort of strategy going forward. Managing this risk is always in your contract specifications, so you want to make sure that uh, there's an alignment with the sampling and soil management strategy in your contract specifications. If there's any sampling or soil management that you're going to require the contractor to do, you probably want an SP for that. Um, you're also going to want to lay out any storage, transportation, tracking, and documentation requirements. There are generic um, SPs we have developed for various clients that consider this, but we find each project is just so specific and has its own little nuances here um, that it's really best to just talk to us about um, how best to manage that in your contract specifications for things going to tender. And then actually during construction, you wanna make sure that you have good contract administration. So who uh, is going to be your oversight? Um, and also making sure that you're getting your documentation that's required. So if your contractor is doing any sampling that they are required to provide you with the sample results and that um, they need to be to your satisfaction before any soil is moved, that if they're proposing any reuse sites that you are uh, reviewing who those reuse sites are, um, you understand what the reuse criteria again, and that there is an approval process for that as well. So that as a project leader, you're getting that documentation that is required under the regulation. And just making sure that you have a QP involved where needed throughout this entire process. So let's just close out the presentation by touching back on contract specifications because um, you will have noted there's a lot of discussion in this, especially in the strategy in terms of how are you contracting this work. And so I would encourage um, those of you that contract work that would be sole generators, uh, you really probably need to look at the standard specifications that you typically use and broadly make sure that they are updated to align with the excess soil regulation. That said, as Tiana said, you know, each project and contract can be unique. And so at least in the short term, while the industry is adjusting to this regulation coming into place and we're sorting out, you know, best practices and, and the most efficient means of doing things, you may want each individual project contract also reviewed from the lens of the excess soil regulation um, in consideration of schedule, risk issues, and the management approach that's being applied. 
I'd say the big challenge for project leaders will be figuring out how to develop appropriate functional contracts that are, are cost effective and efficiently allow for the delivery and management of work while still protecting risks and liabilities. And for contractors, the challenge will be how to interpret the scopes, how to interpret the contracts, how to cost the work appropriately, and then align your delivery um, per that contract. And if you're struggling with either of these things, this is definitely something that our team would be happy to help you with. And with that, I will try to get out of screen share mode and over to the chat box to see if there are any questions. Okay, I see we got a couple things in here. Give me one second to scroll up. There was a question, Krista, maybe you can just share your screen again on the timing slide and if we can just review that again. Okay, I, I, when I flip my screen back on, Tiana, I'll lose the chat box. So I'll, I'll just let you kind of run through the question. Yeah, I can run through the chat box and then we give can me once, give keep me the once. slides back up. To get that up again. The request was just to explain the timing again. Or if I do it this way. So this is the timing for the phasing in of the regulation. So as of January 1st, 2021, the requirements specific to reuse sites generally kick in with the exception that the additional rules I talked about for large reuse sites that are receiving more than 10,000 cubic meters, those don't kick in until January 1st, 2022. The excess soil standards are firmly in effect as of January 1st, 2021. There's no exceptions to that. The requirements around soil storage and processing kick in. Uh, again, though, there is now this proposed ECA process, which could give you other options. Um, so that, uh, that that's to be determined, I guess, as to how that gets incorporated. I assume the ministry's intention is to get that in before January 1st, 2021. The transportation requirements all kick in January 1st, 2021, with the exception of that formal record that haulers would have to provide. So a written record um, that doesn't kick in until January 1st, 2022. And then those planning requirements that we've um, talked about ad nauseum, those kick in the following year, January 1st, 2022 as well. And then as Tiana noted, the landfilling restriction, so the restriction on landfilling of high quality soils, um, that starts January 1st, 2026. And there are some allowances around that if it's for the purpose of cover or I think some construction within a landfill footprint. So there are some exemptions for that, but generally speaking, assume that high quality soils can't be landfilled after January 1st, 2025. And then the grandfathering clause goes away January 1st, 2026. Great. The next question is we are a contractor and have received tenders that propose that the contractor has to acknowledge that it is the project leader. How should we deal with this? Yeah, and I've I've seen this uh, before, and I've had this question, and I, like I said, to my understanding, you cannot contract out that liability. So as much as your contract says that, the ministry would not recognize that as. Re um, so the agency contracting you would still have to meet all the requirements of the project leader. They have to have the documentation. They'd have to be able to speak to where their souls have gone. Um, you cannot pass off that responsibility. Great, hope that answers your question, Rob. If not, please just type more into the chat box. Um, the next question is from Jamie. He asks, can you walk through how the regulation applies to a small road reconstruction in a residential neighborhood, which through previous geotechnical environmental screening has not been shown to have table two exceedances? How is the road-based material treated differently than the subgrade soil? That is, road-based material may be taken to a separate reuse location. Which exemptions apply to the situation above? So it's a table, it's a table two site with table two soils, and they're looking at what are the reuse options for that material. Uh, perhaps Jamie can type in a little bit more or come off mute, but uh, what it sounds like is the road-based material does not exceed table two, but perhaps underneath it does. So I think he's asking if there's different management options for material that meets table two versus not. So it would be it would be reuse site driven. So if you if your sub base is a different quality, you'd have to look for a reuse site that can accept that quality. If you're talking about road building, though, you're falling in that infrastructure category. So your first best case scenario would be to look for another infrastructure project. 
um, that would require soil that aligns with what you're producing, like the quality that you're producing. Um, but the selection of reuse sites will always be driven by the quality of the material you're generating. And if you have variations in quality, you have to identify those different volumes and qualities and then, uh, and then align them with the appropriate reuse site. Great. I hope that answers your question, Jamie. If not, please uh, feel free to come off mute or type more into the chat box. Uh, the final question comes from Joe. Are there any case studies or lessons learned from excess soil management on large projects? I'm sorry, Tina, can you say that again? Are there any case studies or lessons learned from excess Uh, Joe is asking if we can share any case studies or lessons learned from excess soil management on large projects. Um, so I can speak uh, to some I've seen um, in the past that are large building construction projects where they're importing a lot of material and there was a need to sample and confirm quality before placement. And what you should expect in those cases is you will have, um, even if it's good quality soil, one-off exceedances of one or two parameters is fairly common. And um, what I've unfortunately often seen in the industry is you'll have one sample that exceeds for a parameter and the whole lot of soil is just rejected. And there's lots of options for dealing with limited exceedances that don't involve rejecting a whole pile. So I'd, I'd say a, a lesson learned would be um, look very carefully at the data you get and the options for managing that data. So if you have a pile of soil, you've taken 10 samples and one sample has an exceedance for one or two parameters, um, your first pass might be to just go back and resample because you, if it's barely exceeding standards, um, it could be through a, a regulatory averaging process, you might end up meeting the standards and, and then that pile of soil could be reused. It could also be if it's truly an exceedance by removing that small volume of soil around that exceedance and resampling, the rest of your pile would meet and you could reuse it. Um, so I would say the, the big lesson learned is, is don't just blanketly apply data to a gigantic pile of soil. Soil has a very heterogeneous nature. Um, and there's lots of ways you can deal with minor exceedances of data. Yeah, and some of the other lessons learned, we've touched on this, just in terms of flexibility in the tendering process, language in the tendering process. Uh, those are some really key takeaways um, to help manage risk and avoid delays. Where we see the most uh, delays and frustrations during construction is that there is not enough um, sampling and characterization done in advance. Um, and or there's just not uh, prescriptive enough language in the contract documents um, to really uh, inform the contractor on how they need to be managing these soils. And I think it is important when you're figuring out your soil sampling and, and where it makes sense to do that in your process to consider the the challenges or risks that might exist if you don't collect information in the front end. So the whole question of could your soil volume change and now your data doesn't represent what you're actually removing, um, does that potentially generate a construction delay for you, which is a much more costly issue than perhaps collecting additional data at the front end. So I think those are all things you'd want to consider. Great. Um, we've had a couple questions on whether we can share the slides and, and we're more than happy to uh, provide a PDF after this meeting. Um, we've got some other good questions coming in here. Um, so Leah asks, can you touch on major differences in concentrations between Reg 153 tables versus the Reg 406.1 tables? Yeah, so the um, excess soil standards are actually, generally speaking, more stringent than the brownfield soil standards. And the reason for that is the brownfield soil standards were evolved to reflect a much smaller soil volume. And so I know they've been broadly applied to manage soils up till now. The ministry recognized that if we're looking at coming up with standards that will reflect management of excess soil, the volumes attached to that will be much larger than what we generally assume are impacted soil at a brownfield site. And so those standards weren't appropriate. That said, in the adjusting of the formula and the process they use to evolve the standards to account for larger volumes, what it ultimately means is that the allowed, the allowed uh, concentrations were driven down. And so the standards that are under the excess soil regulation are generally speaking equal or more stringent than what you would see in the brownfields regulation. The next question from Andrew is, are the granular road-based materials, such as Gran A and B, under an existing road treated differently than the subsoil? 
so granular material is not under the regulation. So again, it comes back to that particle size. Um, I think if you were looking at your, your rebuilding roads, you're excavating it. And in the course of all that, that material is all going to be mixed together. And you've got a mix of what would be sort of rock particle and soil particle. Um, excess soil is also considered soil mixed with rock. So you would have to consider the management of that material under the excess soil regulation. One option could be if it makes sense for your project to sort it, to actually distinguish, like separate your rock from your soil and manage those materials separately. Um, but if you're just managing a pile of rock mixed with soil, then that would um, require management under the excess soil regulation. And if this is good uh, granular material that can be separated from the sub base, you might wanna consider um, sort of reusing that as uh, some base on existing roads, so more of an infrastructure to infrastructure exemption that Krista discussed. So if you have uh, something project specific, Andrew, uh, please get in touch with myself or Krista and we can work through those specific questions. Um, the next question comes from Anthony. Uh, he basically indicates that they have an internal reuse site, so I assume that this is something that uh, is owned by you and it's not governed by an instrument, does this mean we do not require an ECA when depositing with a beneficial purpose? That's the first part of the question. And the second part is, what about when we're storing soil internally for treatment, do we need an ECA? So the actual reuse site that does not have an instrument, that it's just accepting soil that is of quality that matches the reuse site characteristics, uh, no, you don't need an ECA for that. You can just move it and reuse it for its beneficial reuse. Um, the treatment question, Tiana, can you read that again? What about when storing soil internally for treatment? And do we need an ECA? So whether or not you need an ECA depends on the processing that you're doing. So there are allowances under the reg for what they, what they generally call low risk processing. So very basic processing that would not require an ECA. If you're doing something that would be would be some kind of more intense processing, like chemical treatment, um, something that's geared to reducing contamination. That is work that would generally require an ECA. Okay, we have a question here from Pursue. For soils brought to the site after an RSC is filed, can excess soil quality that meets the beneficial reuse assessment tool generated standard be acceptable? So uh, this might depend a little bit on whether that RSC site has a CPU associated with it. Um, and the ministry is still kind of, I think, working through how the Brownfields regulation and the excess soil regulation intersect when we're talking about sites that are also managed under a CPU. Um, I think if it's an RSC site, because uh, an RSC just speaks to quality of period in time, I think there's no other instruction, I think, around soil management on that site, then you would fall to the excess soil regulation and then you would have potentially the option of the BRAT tool if it's a site that has a CPU on it, it probably already has really specific soil management requirements and soil standards that would have to be met on that site. And I think you would have to default to what's what's required in the CPU. Great, that is all the questions. I'm just confirming, I think I've touched on everything. There are no follow-up questions. Yeah, so that, that, that concludes the Q&A here, Krista. <clears throat> Super. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we can get the slide deck posted. If you'd like a copy, please reach out to us so we um, can get set up to send that to you. Um, and if you have other questions, please do reach out to Tiana and myself. Happy to um, follow up and answer any questions that you have. And otherwise, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Krista. Thank you.